Hey, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're reading Copper Sun by Sharon M. Draper. And we are now on chapter 10 of the Middle Passage. Afi was right. The next night, the kindly redheaded sailor was nowhere to be seen. Amari was taken to a filthy corner of the ship by a dark-haired, skinny sailor who used her, hurt her, and tossed her back on the deck, bruised and bleeding, all of her dreams finally and forever destroyed. Afi said nothing, but held Amari and rocked her until her tears stopped flowing. The following night, Amari was taken by two sailors. They took turns. She wanted to die. The morning after that brutal assault, Amari spotted Bess and a group of men who were brought on the deck. It was the first time she'd seen him since they had been on the ship. He had lost weight, as most of them had, and his body was covered with welts and sores. He made brief eye contact with Amari, a flicker of hope in his eyes for a moment. The pineapple birthmark looked distorted and shrunken. But she could not face him, for she was no longer the innocent girl he had once loved. She no longer felt worthy of his admiration or, or even his friendship. Amari turned away from him in shame. The routine of the ship took on a horrible monotony. <clears throat> Excuse me. The everlasting indigo blue of the ocean surrounded them day after day. The copper sun and the piercing paleness of the sky, which were so welcome to the captive's homeland, imprisoned them each hour. Every morning the women were fed, doused with salt water, and made to dance. Oh, how Amari hated that drum. The men were then pulled from the hold, squinting in the bright sunlight, filthy, weak, and almost crippled from being tied down for almost 20 hours each day. More and more bodies were tossed overboard, where the huge gray fish waited hungrily for their meal. So the gray fish, as you probably deduced by now, are sharks, and sharks would follow um, the slave ships uh, because just because of this. Uh, it was an easy meal. Uh, you know slaves are going to die for whatever reason. Uh, they're in those horrible conditions at the bottom of the ship. So, of course, some of them were going to die. Um, some were probably just killed by the slavers, the sailors. Um, so the, the, the sharks knew it was an easy meal. So they usually would follow the slave ships because of that. Every evening, the sailors prepared greedily for their night of pleasure. Sometimes Amari was rescued by the red-headed sailor. But on most nights, she was just another female body to be used by one of the 40 or so sailors on board that awful ship. A couple of times, she had seen the large redhead climbing up the mast to do the night watch, so she figured that perhaps he did not always have the opportunity to save her from a night of, def of defilement. Or she thought perhaps he just did not care that much. Amari no longer smiled. Ever. She learned to harden herself from feelings and emotion, as well as from physical pain. She was, however, grateful for any evening of escape from the other men and for the large red-headed man's attempts to teach her their language. And just to stop for a minute, just remember this is, you know, they're on this ship night after night for several weeks, uh, going on months again. Uh, this is at a time where there weren't any motors. So it was, you know, they're on a boat and it's all wind powers, you know what I'm saying? So there's probably some days if the wind's not blowing, you know, the ship is just sitting there. Now, there may be some times where the, where the sailors will try to row, uh, will try to have the boat rolled or something like that. But, you know, if the wind's not blowing, the ship's not moving and you're just on there. And night after night, day after day, um, these women were, you know, raped every night. Um, the guys just had their way with her. And, and it's, you know, never know who, what it was going to be, how many, uh, just a brutal like they said, monotony just happening over and over again. So just think, you know, just keep that in the back of your heads. Uh, she learned his name, which was Bill, and how to say yes and no in quite a few conversational phrases. He showed her how to count using the fingers of her hands. She learned the words hungry and eat, even though hunger was a constant and the food she was given was barely life sustaining, as well as verbs like try and cry and die. The language of the white skins was strange and fell heavily on her tongue, but she continued eagerly. She gathered words as weapons to be used later. What's that? She asked Bill, one rainy night as she pointed to the rain slicker he wore. He told her the name for it, as well as the names of other articles of clothing. He taught her the names of the parts of the body, words for weather, and words for food. She pointed, he named it, she repeated it. He showed her how words connected into phrases. Verbs were difficult for her. I am Bill, he explained. You am Bill, she repeated. 
No, you say you are Bill. I'm not Bill. I are Amari. She was often confused, but slowly it made sense. Amari found that she could understand more than she could say, which she knew was an advantage. Sometimes she repeated words and phrases to herself as the man made her dance or while she was tied up for hours on the deck of the endlessly rocking ship. It kept her from going mad. Uh, and again, just a pause for a hot second. Um, in when you are learning a language, and this happens often, but uh, just as you know, here in America, um, when you know, see people who come from another country or learning a different language, uh, keep keep in mind that language is a or in the English language is a very difficult language to try to learn. Uh, where we have you know, words for every single thing that we do. And some words are spelled that don't make sense. Like, um, how you say through, we go through something and the way it's spelled, like there's, you know, you threw it and then let's go through a door. If the spelling of going through a door is the same as how you would say rough or tough, you know what I mean? Like, and, and so for people coming up from another country, that's incredibly frustrating. It's frustrating for little kids learning the language. So think of her at 15 trying to figure these things out while she's being raped every night, while she's being victimized and violated um, and scared for her life, but also trying to figure, you know, trying to learn this language. So um, it's very, very difficult for her. When Amari woke one morning, the sky was thick with dark, ominous clouds. Cold winds blasted the deck. The ship rocked violently as waves splashed high over the roping on the sides. The women, drenched and terrified, were flung wildly about, held only by the ropes that tied them to the masts. One woman, whose name was Mosi, screamed with desperation as her daughter, who was about four years old, was torn from her arms. At that instant, another huge foaming wave washed over the deck, and the child disappeared with it as it fell back into the ocean. Mosi pulled at her ropes like a crazed animal, broke free, and ran across the deck to the place where her child had disappeared. She looked over the side of the boat and, point, and pointing to a spot some distance away in the water, yelled to the women, I see her! I see her! Oh, my baby! Amari pulled at her ropes, but she could do nothing. A sailor had spotted Mosi and headed toward her. She took one look at him, one final look at the women, as if to say farewell, and leaped gracefully into the sea. Amari watched frantically, waiting for someone to rescue them, but the sailors, too busy with the sudden storm, never even bothered to glance overboard to see the fate of the mother and child. They were simply two more dead slaves. They did, however, untie the women then and led them to the lower deck. It had been many days, perhaps weeks, since they had been in this area of the ship. Amari had lost all count of days and time. The stench, which had been unbearable at the beginning of the voyage, was now almost unbreathable. It seemed that no one had bothered to clean out the lower deck since the voyage began. The men, tied there for over 20 hours a day, had no choice but to lie in the filth. Many of the bottom levels of the shelving were empty, Amari noticed. That was a result of the constant stream of, de of stiff, deaf, dead bodies that were tossed overboard each morning, she realized. So just a uh, pause real, real real quick. Remember how they were stacked um, three, you know, three on, on different shelves and the person on the bottom had, you know, the waist from the top two people falling on to onto them. Um, plus the waist that would just fall on the floor, plus their own waist. Um, that is very, very unsanitary. And so the person who's on the bottom is getting that from both ways. And a lot of times it was just too much for them and they would die. Um, and so that's when, when they were seeing dead bodies come off, that's what you were seeing. Those people on the, on that bottom shelf. Um, if you were unlucky to be on the bottom shelf, it was probably, um, pretty unlikely that you'd be able to survive. Um, and here they are coming back in there and, and you know, they've, they've been in fresh air for so long. This is like probably too much for the for the uh for the women when they came back amari and the other women splashed slowly through the slime of urine and feces and vomit that covered the floor rats now grown huge and healthy chewed on the emaciated bodies of some of the men chained there too weak or too tightly chained to shake them off the men suffered in silent agony and to pause just briefly real quick just think of that like you're you have waste on you you're sick you're uh, weak from just being chained and then a rat comes and starts chewing on you you know what i mean like that's just just a height of 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 uh, uh of embarrassment um and not just embarrassment just of pain and agony to have to have animals eating you as you're sitting there 
The women were tra- chained to what the tailor to what the sailors called the tween deck. The door of the hold was closed behind them. Amari vomited, unable to fight the nausea. So did many others. Hour after hour, the ship bucked through the storm. Children clutched their mothers. Women moaned. Everyone prayed. At first, Amari prayed for the storm to stop. Soon, she simply wished that the ship would be taken by the storm and sunk to the bottom of the ocean. But no relief was to come that night, nor the next day. The winds kept roaring. The ship rolled, and the slave chain beneath the decks suffered endlessly. Finally, finally, Amari realized that the movement of the ship had slowed. She could no longer hear the wind. Too weak to move, she lay huddled in a ball, bemoaning the fact that she was still alive. She heard the sounds of a door opening. The sailors who entered began to curse at the sight before them. They unchained the women and led them to the deck. They did not bother bother to tie them, for they were too weak to even stand. Of the 90 women left on board, 16 had died during that storm. Ten of the children had died as well. The women watched with empty eyes as the bodies were tossed overboard. Amari wished that she had been one of them.